Hello team, this is Brenda and we are in week two of Issues in OT Practice 1 and today we are talking about the profession, philosophy, and language of occupational therapy. How do we talk about occupational therapy? How does that change how we think about occupational therapy? And as you're in the process now of becoming an occupational therapy professional, and by the way, welcome to the profession, you already do have a role as an occupational therapy student. Uh, you are already within the profession of occupational therapy. So as you are becoming that occupational therapy professional, how do you think about occupation? Why is that even important? Why do we have a whole profession about occupation? We talked about that a little bit last week, but now we're going to get into some of the things that our professional association says about occupation and occupational therapy, um, what the philosophy behind occupational therapy is, uh, why this profession was created in the first place, and how do we talk about occupational therapy. Before we get into that, let's go look at our just-in-time quiz. So by now you will have answered some of these questions for me. I'm going to touch on them just a little bit right now, but really I'm hoping that they're answered throughout the rest of this PowerPoint today. So we talked about naming two activity demands and giving examples. That is from the OT practice framework. If you look at table 7, it actually lists activity and occupational demands. And those are things like the time it takes to do an activity, the space that is required, the physical demands that are required of the person, um, some of those sorts of things. So take a look at that table and that will answer that question for you. And the second question, according to Adolf Meyer in his 1922 article, how does man learn to organize time? And his simple response to that is that people learn to organize time by doing things. And it is in doing these things that we organize our lives, that we, that we break our life into chunks um, that we call time. Um, it is actually, a, if you think about it, it's a sociological construct that we measure time in the first place. How is it that we all agreed to 24 hours a day and 60 minutes in each hour? That's a social construct and we've learned to organize our time by how we do things together and we decide individually how we are going to fill up that time. What is meant by the term occupation as a means and occupation as an end and this can be found in your O'Brien and Hussey reading um, in, the, in chapter 3 in the book and basically what we mean by that is that Occupational therapists use occupation as a way to engage people in activities that can help them get better, that can help them heal or recover. And we use occupation as an end because occupation is also the goal of our treatment. We want someone to be able to engage in their desired occupations, the things that they want to do by the time they are done with treatment. So since we're talking about entering the profession, this is something that is really important for you to know. It's actually one of our ACOAT standards that you know how it is that you have to enter the profession. So you're probably going to hear this at various points along the way, but just to review it at this point. As a registered occupational therapist, you have to, first of all, graduate from an ACOAT accredited organization, uh, which is currently a master's or a doctorate in the United States. You also have to successfully complete your field work, which of course is redundant because you're not going to graduate unless you successfully complete your field work. You also have to successfully complete the NBCOT exam. Now, every state in the nation now requires some form of licensure, and every state in the nation now points to completion of the NBCOT exam in order for you to get that license. So unlike nursing or education where you have to take a different test in every state, in the United States you only need to take one exam and it is recognized by all the different states. 
That being said, once you successfully get a license, I recommend that you keep your initial license. So if your initial license is in Indiana and you move to Hawaii and then Nevada and then Florida, keep your Indiana license because it will make getting licenses along the way uh, easier in other states. You don't have to keep every license, but keep your original license to show that you pass that test and that you um, have successfully completed all the entry level requirements. Now for occupational therapy assistance, they have much the same process. They have to graduate from an accredited organization at an associate level at least. Uh, they have to successfully complete their field work and they have to successfully complete their own exam. So we talked about the definition of occupational therapy last week and we're recapping it here because we're going to be using it. So just to, to review it, the therapeutic use of everyday life activities or occupations with individuals or groups for the purpose of enhancing or enabling participation in roles, habits, and routines in home, school, workplace, community, and other settings. Now, I encouraged you last week, and we all took the time to write our own definition of occupational therapy, which I think is best because this is, of course, a bit of a dry definition. This is a definition that is really made um, in some ways for legal purposes, um, but it has all the elements in it that we want to be able to communicate to people. So I encourage you to take it and make it your own and talk about what roles might be important to different people, why habits and routines are important, the types of settings um, or contexts that people do these things in and why those contexts are important, important. Um, and you're well on your way to developing your own elevator speech about occupational therapy. So here are some other ways that we talk about occupational therapy. And again, why is language important? Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, you know the idea that in Alaska they have, oh, I don't know, 20 some words for snow. Uh, and in Indiana we have one word for snow, but we have lots of words for wet things falling from the sky. We have rain and sleet and hail and snow and, and uh we have a uh, you know mist and and all these different uh, words that we use for things that fall from the sky that are wet. Uh, if you go to uh, tropical regions, um, say Latin America, you have the word snow and the word rain, and everything has to fall into those two categories, and the nuances are sort of lost. Now I can't tell you 27 differences in in snow, but uh, I can tell you the difference between snow and hail, and that might be too fine of a distinction for someone who doesn't have language to talk about it. So that illustration is to let you know that having language lets us describe things in different ways. And that's why the language of occupational therapy is very important. And that's what the OT practice framework is all about. Now you might have decided that it was good bedtime reading because it would put you to sleep because it is a bit of a dry document. But I hope that through the process of time that you're in school that that document will start to come to life for you. Because in some of those dry words that that, that you have, there is the life of the profession. There are ways that we can think about and describe what occupational therapists do that are going to help us, um, one, think of things to do with clients, and two, defend our own profession and be able to say, this is our domain. These are the things that occupational therapists do. Very important. Okay, so some of these definitions. Um, it is a transactional relationship. Uh, there are actually many of our theories that talk about how uh, there's a transaction between the person and the environment um, that's around them and the occupations that they want to engage in. And that when we plan interventions, we are facilitating the person's engagement in those things. And the end result that we're looking for is participation and engagement with those desired occupations. Uh, we have other words that we use to talk about that, habilitation. Uh, rehabilitation and promotion of health and wellness and we talk about acquisition of an occupational identity and also preservation of that so acquisition for maybe a child who uh, is having a learning disability and having a hard time uh, engaging in ways that will help them to be part of a society that they want to be a part of 
and preservation for, say, an older adult who has lost many roles because of retirement or perhaps death of a spouse or perhaps an illness or injury that keeps them from doing the things that they love. And occupational therapy helps people to do those things. Here's our definition of occupation that we talked about last week. Again, just for review, I love the simplicity of saying that occupations include things that people need to, want to, and are expected to do. And I have used that definition over and over again in the community, and people get it. They're like, oh, it's not just jobs. So that's a really helpful little uh, thing to remember, and it's easy to remember. So defining occupations. There are many aspects of occupations. They are, we've talked about last week how they are daily life activities in which people engage. It's very important to remember that these are goal directed. Occupations are the bigger pieces. We talked about activities and tasks as being smaller pieces. And occupation is the bigger piece and one thing that sets it apart from an activity or a task is that it's goal directed. Um, I think we might have used the illustration of gardening last week that if you consider yourself a gardener you might not like the activity of pulling weeds but you do it as part of your bigger role as a gardener. Uh, it's part of a goal-directed occupation and yes there is some goal-directedness in pulling the weeds but the activity itself may not necessarily be desired. All occupations occur in a context. They occur over time, just like Adolf Meyer talks about things uh, occurring over time and how the importance of time, um, what the importance of time is to occupation. Uh, occupations occur over time and they have purpose, meaning, and utility. They can be observed or they may be simply internal, known only to the person involved. And they can involve the execution of multiple activities for completion of one occupation. Like in the gardening example, we might weed, we might water, we might uh, plant seeds, we might um, cultivate, we might pick the final vegetables or flowers that are produced. We might show off our garden to our families and friends. And there can also be various outcomes. For example, uh, my tomatoes did well this, this year, but my peppers did not. So, uh, but, but last year the peppers did a little bit better. So the outcomes can be different. So philosophy. Let's talk a little bit about what philosophy is. I know all of you are groaning, right? Or some of you are anyway. Our book talks about the three different aspects of philosophy. Metaphysical means what is humankind? What is the definition of humans? Epistemological means how does a person know what he or she knows? How do you know that you know it? And axiology is what is desirable. So let's take a look at the philosophy of occupational therapy from those three aspects. We also have to look at what understanding OT includes. It includes the philosophy and the history of occupational therapy. So guess what we're going to be looking at in a few weeks? You guys are going to be presenting on the history of OT. It also talks about the domain or the scope of our practice and what the process of our practice is. That helps us to define what is occupational therapy and what is it not. Also our core values and our code of ethics explain a little bit more about who we are and what we say we want to do. And then in occupational therapy, we have many, many position statements which are available on the AOTA website that shows what is occupational therapy's position on our work with certain aspects of OT uh, and our certain take on uh, the current healthcare climate in the United States. Uh, I know that there's a position paper being worked on right now about occupational therapists in skilled nursing facilities and what should be expected in, way of, in the way of productivity, which is a very important hot button issue right now. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of occupational therapy and Adolf Meyer, who, although he wasn't included in the first bunch of people who were at the um, first meeting of occupational therapists, he was definitely one of the early promoters and early developers of occupational therapy. He also knew Eleanor Clark Slagle, as I'm sure you will come to find out, was a very important figure in occupational therapy history. And in his 1921 speech to the National Society for the Promotion of Occupational Therapy, he gave this speech called the Philosophy of Occupation Therapy which of course he didn't quite have the name 
right. Um, the name has evolved a bit over time. I think at that time it was called both occupation therapy and occupational therapy. But he talked about the problems of adaptation uh, that people have when they have some sort of a disability uh, that people can't adapt. So even that early on, that word adapt was coming into occupational therapy language. The importance of a person being able to adapt to the situation that they find themselves in. He also talked about the importance of pleasure. This is really interesting. The pleasure in achievement, a real pleasure in the use and activity of one's hands, and a happy appreciation of time. That that feeling of achievement or that pleasurable aspect of occupation and what I think he was really talking about was the meaningfulness of occupation became useful in management of mental health patients during that time. Remember this was part of the moral treatment movement when we were discovering that if we didn't lock up mental health patients in padded rooms but instead gave them something to do they got better. He also talked about how a balance of all these different healthful aspects, work, play, rest, and sleep, were important. Doesn't that sound a lot like health and wellness and what we promote as occupational therapists? And he talked about providing opportunities rather than prescriptions. So even early on, there was that tension between the medical model and the way occupational therapy approaches health care. So this is what Meyer thought about what an occupational therapist should be. And take a look at this list and see if you think these characteristics are still things that occupational therapists should have. Now, bear in mind, he was speaking from a position of a hundred years ago and uh, at a time when he was giving a speech where he was trying to incite passion rather than be all inclusive. Uh, but I find it rather interesting that being resourceful and respecting the client and um, giving the client the, the freedom to try to adapt on their own were, were characteristics that he represented, that he recognized uh, even back then at that point in time. And this is how Meyer summarized his own talk in his speech. Man learns to organize time and he does it in terms of doing things. And one of the many good things he does between eating, drinking, and wholesome nutrition generally and the flights of fancy, which he meant daydreaming, and aspiration, we call work and occupation. We might call it the ingestion and digestion and proper use, and we might say a religious conscience of time with its succession of opportunities. Meyer viewed time as the one resource that would continue to come and come and and that was always available to people that even if you didn't have yesterday you've got now and you've got tomorrow and I found find that a really interesting philosophy a really interesting way to think about things um, so think about that for just a moment do you consider time to be a resource uh, rather than an enemy uh, in how uh, we might help someone progress Now today our philosophical base is a little bit different. It's a little more uh, careful in its wording. It's less passionate and more um, descriptive. Uh, and here is a portion of it. Um, it is uh, an official American Occupational Therapy Association document. And we talk about how occupations bring meaning to individuals and that all individuals have an innate need and right to engage in meaningful occupations throughout their lives. There's our occupational justice coming in. And that a person really needs occupations in order to achieve health and well-being. And that is a firm belief of occupational therapists that has been a thread all throughout our history. And I hope that that's one thing that you'll be able to see as you're doing your history assignments is that thread of the importance of occupation in helping someone achieve health and well-being. So now it's your turn. I'm going to have you pause the recording and discuss how well do you think Meyer's philosophy of occupation therapy and the Commission on Education's rendition of OT philosophy match up? How are they alike and how are they different? So take a moment and discuss that in uh, smaller groups. You can just do it where you're sitting. 
And if you are sitting in class right now, you can uh, then maybe share in the larger group some of the ways that you think uh, these two philosophies, the historical one and the recent one, match up and how they might be different. All right, so let's move on to discussing what is the metaphysical uh, philosophy and occupational therapy. In other words, what is humankind? How does OT address this idea of philosophy? Well, we talk about holism. We talk about the importance of humans to be active. All humans have some desire to be active and engage in the environment around them. We also talk about how humans are open systems. They are continually interacting with the environment around them, acting on that environment and being acted on by that environment. People both influence and are influenced by their environments. And we also have ways that we classify occupation. We classify occupation in a larger sense by saying that it's something that we need for health and wellness. And we also break it down into areas of occupation that we feel are um, indicative of the different areas of people's life that they need um, to participate in. Um, and that you can see in the OT practice framework. So epistemological philosophy and occupational therapy or how does a person know what he or she knows. In occupational therapy we talk about how people think about occupation, they feel certain ways about occupation and then they actually involve themselves in occupation. So there are several levels to occupation. We have an idea or a concept of our use of time and we select goal-directed behavior. So we have to have thought about the occupation in order to have a goal in mind. Now that goal can be as simple as um, I'm going to get from here to there across the room like a baby crawling because I want to get that thing that's over there um, like the ball or whatever. Um, or it can be something grander like I want to become an occupational therapist and so I'm going to go to school for three years. We also believe as occupational therapists that a person has to do in order to learn. Uh, that there, not only do we think and feel about what we do, but we do in order to learn how to think and feel. We engage in our environment and therefore learn from our environment by engaging with it. And by environment we mean not only just the, the place around us, but also the people around us. We talked a little bit earlier about how occupation is both a means and an end and that goes with this thinking, feeling and doing. That occupation as a means is we have a goal and we're trying to get to that goal and we might use occupation as a means for getting there. We might do certain activities to help us gain uh, the, the ability that we want. Sports is a good example. Let's say you want to be an awesome swimmer, okay? You want to be the next Michael Phelps. You not only swim, but you probably also lift weights and you watch your diet and you get enough sleep and you do a lot of things when you're in training for that kind of strenuous physical activity that are a means to getting to the goal. But occupation is also an end because if you're doing all those things, what you really want to be capable of doing is swimming for the gold medal. So our clients, they may not be swimming for gold medals, but they're looking at an end goal and that is occupation and they're also looking at a means of getting there and that is occupation as well. Adaptation is another important concept. How a person knows what they know is that they are adapting. When a person engages in occupation, they have to adapt in order to um, figure out how to do something. Think about the first time you learned to ride a bike or shoot a basketball. You didn't just automatically do it perfectly. You had to practice it over and over and over again and you adapted to what you felt and what you saw in order to be able to complete the occupation. Everybody does that with every occupation that they do. We learn to achieve mastery over the environment by participating in occupations. And that is one way that we know what we know. 
Mary Riley talked about this in 1962 when she said that man through the use of his hands as they are energized by mind and will can influence the state of his own health. This is that the great hypothesis or the great axiom that you will hear over and over again in occupational therapy. So you might as well memorize it now because just about everybody at conference can quote it together. Um, and the, the idea is that health and wellness is wrapped up in the things that we do and the things that we do are wrapped up not only in what we do with our hands but by using our mind and our will or our emotions there's so much in this short phrase uh, that really encapsulates what occupational therapy is so good phrase to memorize so it's your turn I'm gonna have you stop the recording once again and discuss how do humans show adaptation when they want to get something done? Give us an example of effective adaptation and ineffective adaptation. And how can OTs facilitate adaptation with their clients? What do you think? On day two of our class, uh, what have you already learned about occupational therapy that, that you see helps people adapt? How can we facilitate that adaptation with our clients? So spend a few minutes talking about that in groups. Share what you have learned with the class. Um, if this does turn out to be something that you watch at home, jot down some of your thoughts. Talk about it with some of your classmates. And we'll pause now for just a moment. Okay, and our last area of philosophy, axiology and occupational therapy. What is desirable? Well, one of the things that occupational therapists believe is desirable is participation in occupation. And we believe that people want to participate with family and significant others. And this is part of actually humanistic values, caring about people. And if you take a look at the core values of occupational therapy, uh, which you can find in your text and you can also find in the code of ethics uh, in the preamble to the or the actually right after the preamble in the occupational therapy code of ethics it talks about why do OTs think these things are ethical and it's because we have these core values and here they are altruism putting others needs first how many of you think that that is important I think we all do and that's why we're here Equality and fairness, making sure that everybody has access, in particular, to health care. Uh, but equality and fairness to all the resources in our society. Freedom, we believe in personal choice and having the client be able to guide uh, their own plan of care. Justice, we believe in being fair and impartial. Dignity, uh, we believe in the individuality and the meaningfulness of occupation. We think that we should be truthful. And we also think that we have to be prudent. We have to use sound ethical reasoning and good judgment, and we have to reflect on our decision making in order to make uh, good decisions in the future based on the way things have gone in the past. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about later on in the semester is what happens when some of these things are in conflict with each other. And uh, that's going to be a conversation for another day. So let's just speak a word here about socioeconomic status and culture. Uh, here are some of the phrases that you will see in occupational therapy that address these issues. Uh, occupational depri deprivation, which is reduction of activity options. Who do you think might have that? Who might be deprived of occupations? You might think about someone who's in an institution like a skilled nursing facility or a prison. Or you might think about somebody who's homeless who doesn't have access to a lot of different op occupations. Occupational disparities, such as unequal activity opportunity. Um, Beth Ann is deeply involved in um, power soccer, which is soccer for people in power wheelchairs, which I think is a great way to address occupational disparities. If you are differently abled and don't have access to playing soccer with your peers, what can we do to get rid of that disparity and power soccer is a great answer to that. 
Occupational interruption, what happens when someone has occupational performance interrupted? Now this can happen due to someone's own disability, but what about natural disasters? What about war? Uh, what about some of the other um, humanitarian crisis issues that can come up in our world? And occupational imbalance, when someone uh, can't spend time in activities that are needed for adequate health, well-being, and life satisfaction. Um, so someone who is working too many hours a day or who's spending too many hours caregiving. Um, so those are some of the, the differences, um, the phrases that you might see um, discussing those types of issues. So how do OTs manage all this? That's a lot to think about. Um, we do this with the critical reasoning process. You're going to be talking about activity analysis. Um, I believe that um, Kate and Allison are going to have you do a bunch of activity analysis where you're thinking about the demands, the skills needed, the cultural meanings of occupations. Um, and when you're doing that activity analysis, think about taking into account a person's particular interests and goals. Another thing that occupational therapists do is look at the just right challenge. How can we address that gap between where the person needs to be and where they currently are? The, the activity demand, what the activity is demanding that they do, and we talked about that from the OT practice framework, and what the client is currently capable of. How can we find that gap and how can we provide a challenge to that client that helps them address that gap? Here's another person who was one of the early folks in occupational therapy, William Rush Dunton, who is largely considered the father of American occupational therapy. And here's one of the things that he said. I really like this quote. All patients should have occupations that they enjoy, that sick minds, sick bodies, and sick souls may be healed through occupation. So now it's your turn again. We're going to have a lab activity. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through a, um, a couple more slides though after this. Um, so depending on how this is playing out, you may pause here for the lab activity or you may um, be continuing on with the rest of the PowerPoint and then doing the lab activities together. So now we're going to come back to the topic of language and terminology. So how did occupational therapists get all these different ways that they talk about things that are written down in the OT practice framework? Well, they come from the World Health Organization International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, which is often called the WHO ICF, um, and also from the, the practice framework. But the OT practice framework is based on the ICF um, so that we can have a common language with other healthcare providers. Uh, and the terms ADL, um, IADL are not exclusive to occupational therapy. They are used by other health care providers just as one example of um, how our terminology, terminology helps us build bonds with our brethren in other professions rather than breaking them down. So in 1979, they came up with this thing called Uniform Terminology for Occupational Therapists. And I'm old enough that that was actually the, the uh, thing that I learned um, when it came to what, uh, you know, what, how occupational therapists talked. Now you think the OT practice framework is boring and dry. Uniform terminology was 10 times worse because all it was was like a dictionary of terms and we were supposed to read it and memorize it like by the first day of school. So I'm not that mean. I didn't make you do that. Um, and the OT practice framework is, is really too long to do that. And you've really got, you know, a couple years here to learn the OT practice framework thoroughly. But I can imagine that by the time you're done with school, you're going to, you would be able to rattle off all the different occupations, all the different client factors and so forth um, from our OT practice framework. Now, in the 1990s, we had a lot of theoretical growth, which prompted this sort of explosion of language, and we decided that um, we needed to develop something a little more um, thorough when it came to um, our language. So the result of that was the OT practice framework domain and process. And off the top of my head, I'm thinking here that the first edition came out in 2002. And our most current edition came out in 2015. 
So um, a word about ACOAT standards here. Just so that you know what all those different um, uh, the standards are that are on your syllabi and every single one of your occupational therapy courses is going to have ACOAT standards 9.2 and so forth. Those standards are so that we make sure that we teach you everything that you need to know to become an occupational therapist and that we have to address them, all of them, in two courses each. So you'll um, you know hear about the OT practice framework here and elsewhere. You'll hear about OT theory here and elsewhere. Actually, you have a whole class on theory, and I get to teach that. I'm looking forward to that. So let's move on. Let's talk about the OT domain, the OT practice framework as a paradigm. So we're going to spend a little more time on this later on in the semester but if you think about a paradigm as an umbrella that covers an entire profession in some ways kind of protecting it with its language the OT practice framework is like that for us it defines what occupational therapy is which sort of sets the boundaries for what it is not it's a very broad definition though so we have a lot of things that are under our umbrella and here are some of those things uh, this little schematic has in the center the client and the client has certain client factors that have to do with uh, musculoskeletal and um, neurological issues and, and how are their different body systems working and then how do they put those client factors together to form performance skills and performance patterns. Now surrounding them are all the different areas of occupation. We have work, play, education, social participation, rest and sleep, um, instrumental activities of daily living, activities of daily living, and leisure. And all those are embedded in a context and environment. And this schematic helps us think of it in that way, how, how the our little nucleus here is embedded in that environment. Now we also have an OT process and this incorporates some aspect of systems theory which we will talk about more later on but basically systems theory says that we are part of an open system that um, we're not a closed system we don't just kind of live within our little selves but we, we live in this system with our environment and so we the OT process comes out of this systems theory and says we go through this process with clients. First we take an occupational profile which is essentially a history focused on a person's occupations. What have they done in the past? What do they desire to do? What's most important to them? Then we collaborate with the client to develop this intervention plan. We carry out this intervention plan, we assess our intervention plan, and then look at how we're going to discharge that person and that's all part of that intervention plan. So here's the schematic for the OT process and you can see how it isn't, the, it, it isn't always just linear. Kind of all those aspects are always going on at once. We might start with the occupational profile and analyzing a person's occupational performance um, and move toward the intervention plan, but then something might come up that takes us back to the analysis. We're going to select our outcome measures. How are we going to know when we've achieved what, what we want to achieve? That's what our outcome measures are going to tell us. How are we going to measure that? And then we're going to look at what outcomes do we want and we're going to assess did we reach that or not and we definitely take the clients aspect into account do they feel like they reached that goal or not we will spend more time on the process later in the semester I want to focus on the domain day here are the different aspects of occupational therapy domain we have our occupations we have our client factors we have performance skills and performance patterns and we have context and environments. Now what I've got for you is a case study and I'm not going to show this for very long because it's also on the Google Drive. You will see the link to the Google document um, in, um, uh, in ACE under lessons and you will just click on that and you will find this same case study in the Google Drive um, in the Google Slides and what I'm going to have you do is use your imagination to analyze Jasmine for your assigned areas of the OT practice framework. So there are 14 slides. You can break them up among your different groups. Uh, some groups might be doing two slides, but some are going to go quicker than others. Think about Jasmine and the things that you've learned about her from this brief case study. 
What specific areas of OT domain might OT address with Jasmine based on that OT practice framework? And you can further break it down based on the specific areas of the domain. Then you're going to share your analysis with the class. Your group will share that. Um, and then uh, pardon the mistake in your slides where it says email me the slide. You don't have to do that because we're now using Google Slides. Thank you very much for putting up with a bit of a boring format today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.